from the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, innovation, and much more. This is Metro Focus with Rafael P. Roman. Tonight, scandals in Albany and a shakeup in the New York mayoral race. Look, I made some big mistakes, and I know I let a lot of people down. Building up as hurricane season looms. Just went up a little bit at a time, and a little bit more, and next thing I know, it was up in the air, and I felt relieved. Building better in Brownsville. We have higher rates of homelessness in New York now than we've seen ever. And art from among the ruins. The materials were just everywhere, so I just grabbed whatever I can use. Funding for this program is made possible by James and Merrill Tisch, Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Jody and John Arnhold, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the Nissan Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. Welcome to Metro Focus. It's not politics as usual in New York. In Albany, more wiretaps, more corruption charges, and a call for reform. And in New York City, a new entry into the race for mayor in spite of an old scandal. We'll have analysis in a minute, but first a quick overview. In April, a wave of criminal charges hit a state assembly member, two state senators, and a New York City council member. Then in early May, former state senator Shirley Huntley went to jail for mail fraud but not before admitting she'd been secretly recording conversations with at least half a dozen fellow legislators. In the middle of all that, Assemblyman Vito Lopez of Brooklyn was forced to resign when more details emerged about year-old charges of sexual harassment. That was Albany. In New York City, the mayoral race spun off in a new direction when former Congressman Anthony Weiner announced his candidacy. Two years ago, Weiner first denied and then admitted he tweeted lewd photos of himself to several women. In his video campaign announcement, Weiner, with his wife beside him, tried to put the scandal behind him. Look, I made some big mistakes, and I know I let a lot of people down, but I've also learned some tough lessons. I'm running for mayor because I've been fighting for the middle class and those struggling to make it my entire life. And I hope I get a second chance to work for you. I will fight for you every single day. Thank you for watching. And joining me to discuss all things political in New York is Jarrett Murphy, the editor-in-chief of City Limits and a partner in our joint reporting project, The Five Borough Ballot. Jarrett, welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, Jarrett, is Anthony Weiner's entry into the mayoral race shaking it up? Uh, it certainly is. You know, we see that he has leapt from being a non-candidate to being in second place mm. and to, you know, really sort of rivaling Chris Quinn for momentum at this point. Uh, what we've noticed actually in our reporting with our partner city and state in the five borough ballot project is uh, an interesting difference uh, amid, among neighborhoods in terms of how they see Wiener. What's, it, what's that like? Staten Island, you know, our most conservative borough, yeah. uh, is actually the most uh, welcoming to him. We found voters who don't want him to run, but we also found some who are willing to kind of give him a chance. In Bayside, Queens, which is in his old district, uh, people are uniformly down on him, at least the ones we spoke to. That's anecdotal evidence, but it's pretty strong. They did not want him <laughs> to run. It wasn't that they didn't forgive him for his transgressions and his marriage. It's just they don't want him to run for mayor. Mm. And in Brownsville, Brooklyn, where I've been doing reporting, he's just not on the radar screen at all. Um, even though people watch the news, read the papers, they know about his presence in the race or, or you know, soon to be presence in the race uh, at the point that I was doing my reporting, but uh, he just is not on people's minds. It's Quinn, it's Thompson, it's Lou, it's not Anthony Weiner. And, and I know this is conjecture very quickly. Why do you think he's doing this? Um, you know, I think he, he ran a very strong race in 2005. He came in within a few, I think, hundred votes of qualifying for a runoff. Mm -hmm. Really surprised people by doing it without major endorsements or much money. Uh, and he was touted as a potential next mayor of the city. In 2009, he skipped the race because Mayor Bloomberg decided to stay in. Mm. And then, of course, the thing happened to him that drove him from Congress. I suspect he thinks that this is his sort of last best shot, if not to win the mayoralty, at least to establish himself as a serious politician again. Um, you know, it's possible, if he were to sit this one out and a Democrat wins, we're talking eight years before you hear from him again. Uh, but if he can run a strong race and keep his name in the mix, then, you know, maybe that pr pretends a political future for him. Now, uh what are you finding in the five borough ballot reporting? Are, are people becoming more familiar with the names and faces of, of all the candidates, if not with their positions? 
It's interesting. People who are paying <coughs> attention are becoming more familiar. Yeah. Um, you know, there are people who still wonder if there's a mayor race on. When I, you know, <laughs> I was at an event with John Lew in Brownsville last week, and uh, one woman asked me afterwards what he was running for. Mm -hmm. But people who are paying attention are beginning to learn the candidates because they actually are beginning to meet them. Um, you know, candidates are starting to start press the flesh. Um, attend, you know, events. I saw Carry On at a community group meeting. I saw Lou handing out certificates to older Americans at a senior center. So that is beginning to occur, and that's incredibly important um, because people aren't really paying attention to specific issues. There are issues that matter to them, but like they, what? Like what? Uh, crime is huge. Uh -huh. uh, education is very big. Um, a general sense the city is being priced out of their reach yeah. are probably the biggest ones yeah. we hear. And, and as, they're, as they're getting to know the candidates more, how is that affecting the candidates, their positions in the polls? Um, it's interesting. I think that, you know, we've seen Christine Quinn have the most interesting trajectory. Um, you know, she was in February, January, uh, close to being where she could theoretically say she was going to avoid a runoff. She was going to win the primary outright and then face a general election rep Republican a challenger. Um, now she has slipped substantially in the polls from about 37 percent to 25 percent. That's probably because of Wiener. It's probably because she's a front runner and people are attacking her. Maybe as people get to know her, they don't like her as much, but that's definitely been the biggest case of people getting to know someone and apparently liking them less. Now, let's talk about the scandals in Albany. With all the scandals swirling around there, is any serious work getting done? Some is. I mean, you had the Assembly recently pass the DREAM Act, which would uh, provide financial aid to uh, state colleges for undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, Governor Cuomo instituted a program a couple weeks ago uh, for uh, in the midst of the scandals mm -hmm. um, to allow businesses that set up on state university campuses to operate tax-free to mm -hmm. encourage you know mm -hmm. entrepreneurship so things are happening um, the scandal is a huge distraction the interesting thing to keep in mind is that Albany's always had a dysfunction problem maybe not always but in our lifetimes yeah. and that's largely because of the way power is divided you have a democratic controlled assembly that's an unassailable control. You have a Senate that was supposed to be Democratic, but then some Democrats who were conservative broke off, or moderates, they broke off and sided the Republicans. Now you have this bifurcated control. That is a long-standing obstacle to getting a lot done that predates the scandal, but it certainly is complicated by it. All right, Jerry. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. For many of us, Memorial Day marked the beginning of summer. But for homeowners still trying to rebuild after Superstorm Sandy, Memorial Day meant the start of a new hurricane season just around the corner. Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism student, Clota McGowan, set out to see why some residents of flood-prone communities hit hard by Superstorm Sandy are moving quickly to physically lift the houses above harm's way and keep their costs down, while others are waiting and hoping that the rising cost of flood insurance won't come their way. We've never seen anything that even resembled this magnitude of a storm, and hopefully we'll never see it again. Hurricane Sandy wreaked $41 billion of havoc in New York State alone and destroyed more than 300,000 homes. Now New Yorkers like Brian and Sonia Hansen, who live on the water, aren't moving out but moving up. The first thing I said to my husband is that if we are not raising the house, we, I am not coming back to this place. So six months after four feet of water rushed through their house, the Hansons watched as it was lifted out of future harm's way. Just went up a little bit at a time and a little bit more, and next thing I know, it was up in the air and I felt relieved. Next hurricane that comes, we won't have that ugly feeling and that sick feeling, is, is this it again? The price tag for the Hansons' peace of mind is upwards of $30,000, but the proof is in the pictures. Some of the Hansons' neighbors raised their homes after Hurricane Irene in 2011. They saw significantly less damage during Sandy than the ones who didn't. It's a lot of work to make it happen. The Hansons brought in Bill Sims, who's raised a dozen houses on the south shore of Long Island since Sandy hit. For each new house jacking, he brings a small meticulous army the day before, which is when the work really begins. That's it, I'm good, man. If you can think about your house sitting where your house sits right now, on a foundation and on the ground, you're hooked up to electric, you're hooked up to plumbing. When we come in to lift your house up, all of that gets disconnected. During the three-hour procedure, the house needs a lot of support, both inside and out. 
We run steel underneath the house, and then we put more pressure under it than what's holding it down, and it goes up in the air. Air power jacks raise the home six inches at a time. After each half foot lift, Sims inspects every crevice to make sure it's staying level while it's on the rise. Jacking up the house is only part of the process. And it's a whole new design. You have to design stairs and decks to get back into your house because now your house is gonna be four or five foot higher. The Hansons' home is now four and a half feet off the ground. We know our investment's safe, so now we can put money into our home again. Tim Smith lives across the street from the Hansons. He plans on raising his home this summer. In the meantime, he's been rallying his neighbors to do the same with a website, the South Shore Lift Project. What's going to happen to the community after a storm like that? Are people just going to leave? Are they just going to walk away from it all? Or are people going to stay here and rebuild? It's not just about being able to come home again. In this mostly blue collar area, many here have their life savings tied up in their houses. You have this little nest egg, you can sell the house and you can make some money from it. A lot of these homes in this area were worth 400, 500,000. Now they're worth a little over 100,000. That's one of the big reasons why we want to raise our house. But for some New Yorkers, raising their home is a much tougher proposition. Some 50 miles away, Sophia Vilakis de Virgilio lives in Queens and in limbo. We would like to be back in here before the summer. Is that realistic? No. That's because here in Broad Channel, a small island in Jamaica Bay, FEMA has redrawn the flood maps after Sandy. Now the city is pushing Dee Virgilio to raise her home not five feet, but double that. We're being threatened with up to $31,000 a year in flood insurance. Who can afford that? So Dee Virgilio is staying on the ground for now, hoping for the maps to be redrawn again. For me, living in this area has been a dream come true. I've always wanted to live as close to the water as possible. I used to dream as a kid about living on a houseboat. It's in my blood. <laughs> Being on the water is in my blood. I think that we're going to rebuild this community better, and we're going to be prepared better than we were in the past. I'm not going to move on. I'm not going to go anywhere. This is where I live. This is my bay. This is, this is the freedom I enjoy. So I'm staying. For Metro Focus, I'm Clota McGowan. The $60 billion in federal aid for Sandy recovery is flowing now, but where we go, what we spend the money on, and what we need to do next is far from settled. On May 16th, we broadcast Superstorm Sandy, a live town hall, and a wide range of experts, live audiences, and NJ Today anchor and managing editor Mike Schneider tackle what worked, what didn't, and what's next. Here's an excerpt of what's still on the agenda more than six months after Sandy. We're at a good place now, finally, in that we're starting to get the federal monies to flow. It's been too slow, candidly, but it's the, the faucet's about to open. Um, so hopefully in the, in the next few weeks uh, over the summer, uh, you're going to see homes starting to be rebuilt. You're going to see business with capital to start to, to move forward. And, but more than just that, we also have to be smart from a long-range planning standpoint. Uh, we have to re-engineer beaches. We have to talk about, you know, where we're going to rebuild certain communities. So a year from today, obviously, we're going to be a lot better off than where we are. And the, the last point is we have to engage everyone in it, the philanthropic community, American Red Cross, and, and our partners there, as well as, as state and local officials. Uh, people from, the, from Manhattan had to come out and help. Um, uh, uh, Nonprofit organizations had to set up uh, shelters and, and distribution centers. Um, and it, it, to me, uh, it, it suggests not how much government can do to help it, but how little government does to help. Uh, it's not that different, when you get right down to it, to what happened in New Orleans, where ultimately the Ninth Ward is being rebuilt by Brad Pitt and not the city or the state or the federal government, um, but by the community. We, we do have the capacity uh, from a technical point of view to mitigate the damage. We don't have the ability to prevent flooding uh, in its entirety, 
Well, uh, it's ultimately going to be a question of money. I'm confident, despite what Joe says, that government will have in place that which they should have had in place before Sandy, particularly as a result of the experience that we uh, had with Irene. But they will have in place uh, uh, a system to, to mitigate the results uh, of this kind of natural disaster. Uh, I want to stay in New York right now with John Cameron back. Uh, he's the chair, Long Island Regional Planning Council. John, once again, I'm referring to my boyhood days. The south shore of the island has been flooding for years in storms far less severe than Sandy, of course. You talked about some of the infrastructure issues before. You talked about some of the sewage treatment areas and things like that. You do have PSE, uh, G parent company coming in to take over from LIPA if the New York legislature uh, agrees with that move. So you could have infrastructure changes as well there. But I mean, do you have even a dollar figure in your mind what it would cost to do that and where that money would come from? Frankly, with all the, uh, all the, I guess, the hype and the publicity over the $60 billion, it sounds like a tremendous amount of money, which it really is. But I think if you talk to the engineering construction community and even the, a lot of municipal officials, you know, it's not enough money to go around to really harden our infrastructure to protect against future events such as the Superstorm Sandy. So we need to prioritize. We need to look to utilize our money cost effectively. We can't elevate all our, our, our critical infrastructure, but that which we can't, we're gonna to look to have to harden in more cost effective ways. The dollars are just phenomenal and uh, we're really not gonna get there, I think, in, in the immediate future. So we, we need to prioritize the most critical infrastructure, in particular, again, on the electric grid, and as well as your water and wastewater systems, uh, that which can really impact the public health and, and our, our, our quality of life here, here in the metropolitan area. Nature is gonna win, ultimately. You can talk all you want about rebuilding, you can put all the money in that you want, you can put houses on lifts, you can change insurance, nature is gonna win. If climate change causes us to have a super storm like Sandy every year or every two years, we are not going to be able to continue to talk about rebuilding, uh, uh, constantly changing insurance plans. We're going to have to find a different way to come at this. In New York City alone, more than 50,000 men, women, and children stay in shelters every night. And there are thousands more throughout the region with no permanent place to call home. Finding innovative ways to help the homeless is the lifelong work of Roseanne Haggerty, president of the nonprofit organization Community Solutions and recipient of the Rockefeller Foundation's prestigious Jane Jacobs Medal. Haggerty is now working in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, where she believes the answer is prevention, as we hear now in our solution segment. Roseanne, welcome to Metro Focus. Thank you, nice to be here. Now, Roseanne, do we have a homelessness, uh, affordable housing crisis in the country and in the city? We certainly do, the numbers bear that out. We have um, higher rates of homelessness in New York now than we've seen ever. And nationally, though the numbers are high, we see some interesting and very hopeful trends. Uh, chronic homelessness and homelessness around veterans is actually declining. Uh -huh. And so this is totally a solvable problem, but uh, we clearly need new ways to think about it. Well, one of the ways that your organization, uh, Community Solutions, is trying to tackle this crisis is through the Brownsville Partnership. Mm -hmm. What is that partnership? Well, it began as an effort to rethink the whole notion of homelessness and why don't we start on the prevention side. And we looked at the data that showed where individuals and families in New York City were coming from who were becoming homeless. And overwhelmingly, it's the 10 poorest neighborhoods of the city. And so we think that the real um, logical next step for our homeless policy is to look at what's going on in these neighborhoods and how to strengthen them so families and individuals have better options and don't become homeless in the first place. But that's grown into a much more uh, complex and rich uh, approach uh, than, than simply uh, focusing on, on people's housing stability. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit because, you know, from what I read, it's very clear uh, that the Brownsville Partnership is trying to improve the quality of life of the people mm -hmm. of the community, but how is it specifically tackling the issue of homelessness? Well, what's interesting is while that was our pathway into Brownsville, um, it didn't take us long to understand that it wasn't simply 
you know, trying to stop evictions or dealing directly with the imminent threat of homelessness that was going to make a difference in a neighborhood like Brownsville. It was actually helping to strengthen the neighborhood itself, building the civic infrastructure, making basic public services work better, uh, helping families get what they needed at times that they were facing crises before they became yeah. absolutely faced with, you know, the, the loss of, of, of their home or the breakdown of their family. And so it's not as simple as um, just saying, you know, we're going to reroute people from homelessness. Yeah. That the big aha was realizing that the best protection any of us have against uh, terrible losses in our life is a functioning community and healthy social network. Now, in Brunswick, you're, you're dealing with huge housing projects that, for reasons that we can't get into here, were purposely designed to isolate them from the, the sidewalks and, and commerce. How do you turn that setup into a healthy, vibrant community? Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, it's just, in retrospect, utter madness to design uh, environments for people to live that were so disconnected and, and, and isolated from, you know, the, the regular street patterns and from, you know, kind of the rich mix of, of uses that we find in healthy city neighborhoods. But there are ideas that, you know, other cities have tried, but that we are actually raising in Brownsville as very, I think, hopeful possibilities, which is to begin reconnecting these blocks to the surrounding street grids, creating sites for new housing development that can uh, serve a mix of incomes and bring needed services, better retail, community facilities, schools to these neighborhoods. Can it serve as a model for the rest of the city and the rest of the country? We absolutely think so because the ideas are very simple and uh, very intuitive, which are in these most extreme neighborhoods that have been very left behind. And frankly, every city in our country has its Brownsville, a community that has the highest rates of many bad outcomes from poverty to incarceration to child welfare involvement to crime. That our insight is you need to work you know, with real commitment and with real um, collaboration in these communities. And so the partnership uh, piece of this is we've um, uh, brought together a, really an extraordinary group of both city agencies, not-for-profits, and especially resident leaders to work on common goals around what it's going to take to turn around this neighborhood and make it a safer, healthier, more prosperous place. And that basic idea of collaboration, of focus, of targeting, very neglected communities, I think, is absolutely applicable and, and smart for any city to think about. All right, Roseanne, thank you so much. Thank you. Summer is here, and down the Jersey Shore, there's great relief that many boardwalks are back in business. But recovery from Hurricane Sandy is far from over. As Lauren Wonka reports now, some local artists are finding new ways to remember both the boardwalks and the storm. As Jersey Shore towns get rid of storm damaged debris to make way for the new boardwalks, artist Roddy Wildman uses that debris to create art. The materials were just everywhere, so I just grabbed whatever I can use. After Sandy, Wildman began collecting everything from pieces of docks, benches, boardwalk planks, and parts of homes and furniture. After the material is cleaned, cut, torched, and designed in his Belmar studio, the debris is transformed into this. It's called a starburst. Wildman, a former contractor, began creating these designs before the storm. That's where most of my work comes from. It was born from working on these houses, using the materials off these houses. The artwork has become a way to memorialize the shore communities. This piece includes debris from a number of shore towns. This green piece of wood is from Ocean Grove's fishing pier, and this is from Long Branch. All the towns are stamped into the design. Wildman donates some of his work and sells the rest. Interest in Wildman's Sandy Memorial pieces continues to grow. So far, he's created about 15 works of art, and he still has truckloads of Sandy-related debris in storage. Very importantly, it's, it's salvaging, it's reusing the materials, and saving them from being in landfills and uh, in our environment. Farther south, historic pen company founder Bob DiMartino is transforming damaged boardwalk planks into Christmas tree ornaments, pens, magnets, and more. He got the idea in Wildwood a year before the storm when he spotted a contractor pulling up old boards. And I asked him, what do you do with the boards? And he pointed over to a dumpster and said they go in there. Just as we're creating the first Wildwood ornament, Sandy hit. It was just a natural to, to see if we could do the same thing here. 
Since the storm, the historic pen company secured boardwalk planks from towns like Point Pleasant Beach. This pen is made from the Trex decking, Atlantic City and Seaside Heights. The famous Jetstar roller coaster lost to the storm is etched into this ornament. But at the moment, the historic pen company is most famous for the pen they created for Prince Harry. And now the calls keep coming in. We've literally gotten orders from over 40 states. The pieces have become especially important to New Jersey residents. You always want to connect to something that your ancestors had. And this has been a common thread for, for people in New Jersey for, for 50, 60 years. And although so many of the boardwalks were torn apart, DiMartino hopes some can take comfort in knowing pieces of them can still be cherished. For Metro Focus, I'm Lauren Wonko in Seaside Heights. That's our program for this week. But before we go, we wanted to share a Metro Focus moment with you. We're proud to see our name all over town with our new promotional campaign running on many of New York's subways and on bus shelters. If you see our logo, take a photo and send it to us with a comment. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, we're at Metro Focus. And online, we're at metrofocus.org. I'm Rafael Piroman. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Funding for this program was made possible by James and Merrill Tisch, Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Jody and John Arnhold, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the Nissan Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus was provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company.